Bobbish. Okay, perfect. Wow, I love the interactivity. Um, thanks so much for coming to my talk. Maybe we can actually continue with that. I'm going to talk about web accessibility today, and I was just wondering whether uh, any of you have been working on web accessibility. Maybe by show of hands? Some folks. Okay, wow, that's cool. Nice. Good to know. Um, okay. Even if you're new to the topic, I hope that there will be something that you can take away from it. But let's dive right in. Um, so really, really quickly, so you know who's talking to you, my name is Josephine. I'm part of the developer relations uh, team at Storyblock. Storyblock is a headless CMS. Um, and you can check them out if you wanted to. I'm also a Girl Code ambassador. Girl Code is an uh, organization that helps promote equal rights and pay for women in the tech industry. And I am here uh, because I'm also an accessibility advocate, or I'd like to consider myself one, because um, I think that's a topic, or making the web a more inclusive place um, is a topic for all of us, I think. But that's enough about me, let's dive right in. Just like a really quick overview of what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a quick look at what web accessibility is and why you should care. I hope that because you came here, <laughs> um, maybe you already care a little bit, but um, if you have to convince somebody, I'm gonna give you some points to kind of um, make your case. And then we're gonna dive into a more practical part, have a look at how we can test for web accessibility as the key features, color contrast, uh, keyword accessibility, and semantic HTML. And um, then we're gonna have a look at how you can very much hands-on get started if you want to implement web accessibility on your project maybe and how you can keep it going. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, web accessibility basically means that the tools and the websites, the projects that we create as developers, as designers are all implemented in a way that people with disabilities can use them. And as we're gonna see, that's gonna benefit all of us, right? Um, and if you get into web accessibility and maybe you're new to it, you might stumble across the A11Y. Um, that's just a numeronym. I always have trouble pronouncing that one for uh, accessibility. So it's basically replacing all the letters between the first and the last one with uh, a number. Like a, what was I gonna say? L10N for localization or I18N. Oh, it's always so hard to not see that written down. But maybe you know those. Um, so ALMY stands for accessibility. Um, we're going to get into this a little bit, um, and there's more abbreviations to come. So we got the WCAG, that's the Web Accessi Content Accessibility Guidelines, and that's kind of a shared international set of rules um, by the W3 Consortium. They agreed on, or they're developing this and continuing to develop this, um, to have kind of something that we can all agree on, basically. This is continued to be approved, so right now we're on version 2.1. Um, since 2018, I think, um, they're working on a draft for 3.0 as well, but that's going to take some time to come out, and they're kind of trying to adapt to all the other changes going on in our field of work. Um, there is, there's three different levels, A, double A, triple A, and they're kind of the levels of strictness, if you will, so triple A is the most inclusive, A is the, the least inclusive, and usually if you get the requirement to fulfill uh, accessibility, usually it's double A standard that you want to comply with, that's required in some countries by law also. There are also some changes in the law coming in the EU, so maybe that's going to affect uh, us more in the future as well. And that's where the headline went. I was wondering about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the WCAG, all those guidelines, they're kind of based around the poor principle, another abbreviation. Um, and that's basically kind of the pillars on what we're trying to achieve with web accessibility. So you wanna make sure that the content that you create um, is perceivable. And that also means um, perceivable, or you wanna have non-text element uh, to be able to translate them to either larger text or speech or um, sign language or whatever that is. You wanna make sure there's, for example, an alt attribute for an image. Um, so that, that's what perceivable means, operable, 
means basically you want to be able to not only use your mouse or your trackpad, but also want to be accessible via the keys, for example, on your keyboard. And it should, everything that you do or that you should create should be accessible as well, right? Through um, or operable. Understandable refers to um, people should know what to do, <laughs> not only what the information that you have means, but also in terms of how to use your page, how to like navigate. And there you could, for example, have proper instructions or labels that refer to that. And you want it to be robust. So you want it to be um, able to be used by as many user agents as possible and that in a stable way. Um, so to be open to assistive technology, for example. And we can achieve that very broadly speaking by writing correct code, if you will, can code. All right, that's the core principles, our foundation, kind of. Um, and the guidelines that I mentioned before that kind of based around that. So every time you wonder why are we doing something um, on an abstract level, you will always be able to kind of bring it back to one of these four things. All right. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, hoping you, I'm hoping you care a little bit about web accessibility already and not only because the tutorial was full that you wanted to go to. Um, but um, if you are in a position where maybe you are thinking about convincing somebody who's giving money for a project or maybe a client of yours is doubtful whether um, web accessibility is something that they should consider, um, there are a number of things that can make your case. First of all, accessibility is a human right as defined by the United Nations. So access to information also on the web is our right as human beings. And that should, I feel like the conversation should stop, stop there. This should convince everybody, but in most cases it, it doesn't. Um, also, if you're a developer and you care about being good at your job, or maybe your employer cares about giving you the resources to be good at your job, you should care about it because in many cases writing semantic code, good code, will already make a ma massive effort to improve accessibility, right? So this should also um, kind of be, if, well, if you care about being good at your job, that should be a priority. Um, I mentioned the new laws that are coming, they're coming in 2025, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not super qualified to talk about what this means. Um, but it will be interpreted differently by the member states of the EU and um, we will need to see how that is going to affect us, but it's something to keep an eye on. And generally, if you are working for companies that are maybe in a market that um, are where already these kinds of laws are in place, like in Canada or in Norway, it's definitely something to consider because it's going to be very expensive not to comply with those laws. Um, you will, again, speaking about money, um, will reach a much wider audience. And um, so 15% of the global population are affected throughout their lifetime um, with some form of access, uh, disability, sorry, uh, or experience some form of disability. And that's a billion people globally. And so if you think about that just as a ballpark, there's so many people and they have a massive spending power. And even if um, somebody in the position to make these decisions doesn't care about all the other stuff, they're going to care about the spending power of those folks, right? Um, and last but not least, we're going to see a bunch of um, use cases where web accessibility benefits all of us and not only people with disabilities. Um, all right. So we're, we're going to see here in this table actually some of the many potential users, right? So we have folks with different kinds of dis disabilities, like physical, auditory, cognitive, visual disabilities. But there's also folks in there who have temporary or situational limitations. And those are also cases in which web accessibility will be super beneficial. So imagine maybe somebody holding a baby. You can only uh, use one arm. Or maybe you're in an environment uh, where you can't turn up the volume, uh, like a library or something, and you're going to rely on captions. 
maybe you have a terrible internet connection, but you want to know what an image is about. And all of these are cases in which web accessibility is going to help you out and it's going to make your user experience so much better. So this is quite powerful if we think about all the cases in which we benefit on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, um, let's get a little bit more practical and dive right in. And we're going to talk about the most commonly going issues that go wrong most commonly. So color contrast is the number one uh, thing that usually goes wrong when testing for accessibility. Keyboard, um, keyboard accessibility is also an important one. And we're going to have a look at semantic HTML, which kind of lays the foundation for everything else. And then um, the first thing I want to look at is color contrast. So color contrast basically means we want the background and the foreground to have enough difference, and that's the ratio that we measure by. Um, and the, the guidelines that I referred to earlier, the, they require to pass level A, double A, 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio. And you can already see, hopefully, <laughs> like the last case over there is super hard to read, like bright, uh, background and then you have a white font that's horrible um, and then of course black uh, font on the white background is the easiest to read it has the highest contrast ratio so we want to aim for something in the middle um, and I know it's really difficult to tackle um, brand colors for example afterwards but we're going to see there's some options if you have like much larger writing um, I think starting from 18 point font, and if you have bold font, it's like 14 point or something, then the requirement even goes down a bit, then you're required to have like three to one contrast ratio, so it's not even that bad. Um, and if you, oh wait, let me switch over to my, there we go. Um, so if you are, <laughs> if you want to test for something like this, we just have a little example project, and there's a couple of tools that you could use to kind of test how your contrast is, um, is uh, performing. So the first thing I want to show you is actually a dis web disability simulator. I don't know if you ever saw this tool, but it's kind of cool. You can simulate how different people might experience your website as, right? So um, let me go for total color blindness, for example. And you see, it's a completely different experience, right? I can still read everything, so that's fine, but it's really um, different. And I can also go for, oh, I don't want to think about it, wait. <laughs> I could go for red-green colorblindness. We don't see much difference. We're not using a lot of red or green. And we can also check for sunshine, for example. And here you see, with like lots of sunshine on the page, it's actually a lot harder to see my illustrations here. This is already not so much fun anymore to read. Um, and it's going to change it, right? And that's a case also that you can make. We need this for everybody. So of course, this is not super accurate. Um, but it's a good idea to get a first impression. And this tool can also help like, you check out other, other um, disabilities. So if we um, want to go a bit more into depth, I have another tool here that's a color contrast checker and this is actually going to help you select the background color and then what did I do? I thought this was blue. Well, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I know, I, I stopped the project from running. Let me really quickly get this back on and I hope now we just get the right colors, bear with me. There we go. That's what I was going for. Okay, cool. Um, here we go. You see, so now we're, we also see it here for the different levels. We have the double A that we're passing. And for the triple A, we're failing for the normal font size, but that's not so bad. And this way you could go through your brand colors or the, the colors that you're using in your CI and just kind of check if you're passing the requirements or not. Ideally, you want, of course, to make sure that everybody on the project knows what colors are possible to combine and what maybe isn't such a great option and also why. Um, and if you have the luxury of like actually defining a new color palette, you can use something like 
um, a tool that helps you kind of evaluate, okay, so what kind of colors can I combine and maybe which ones should I not use together and then just kind of align as a team to be sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, but of course, that's not always the case. So um, you want to make sure that you don't use color as the only indicator of change. So imagine you have these approved and failed uh, little notifications and they're only indicating that something happened because it's like bright green or bright red. And you want to imagine like somebody who can't distinguish between green, uh, green and red is just going to see uh, a bunch of gray. And so that's not going to be super helpful to them. Uh, make sure to not forget about the hover and focus styles. Um, those, those usually get abandoned a little bit, and you want to make sure that the focus is visible at all times, but also has enough color contrast, right? And then it's also a good idea to think about other user groups than you might usually think about. So, um, of course, you can't make everybody happy at the same time, but we've seen earlier the highest contrast has uh, black and white, white together, right? But maybe that's a little bit too much stim like visual stimulation for somebody who's neurodivergent. And this is just something to think about that maybe like a little bit uh, like an off white and maybe not black, but maybe like a really dark gray or something might be a better option to not have like too fleshy, bright contrasts. But again, just some ideas. Um, and if you are in a position where maybe you have already some brand colors that you can't change, and maybe um, maybe you want to have options for folks. So here on GitHub, for example, they have plenty of options um, that you could go for. Of course, that's not a requirement, but it might be a cool idea to have either light or dark and dark mode or normal mode and or just your regular website and then an enhanced contrast version, right? So something that will help people um, kind of play around with that. And um, I actually did that really quickly. Let me get up my system preferences system. I can't type when people are watching. And here we go. So if I switch to dark mode, it's going to go to like a darker version, um, like bringing a bit more color contrast with it. So this is something um, that you could, for example, do in this project. I did it with Tailwind, and then they have this dark option that I can just give a different color to. Of course, Tailwind is something that people have a lot of opinions on, so I guess that's a topic for a different talk, but this is just one of many ways to do this, right? Um, just wanted to bring that up. All right, that was color contrast really quickly. Um, each of these topics, we could go much, much, much further into depth. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, hit me up afterwards or, yeah, if you want to chat. Um, but let's dive into the next topic. So we're going to talk a little bit about keyboard um, accessibility. And what we want to make sure here is that we can tab through all the things and um, that we can also tab away. And we don't want to trap our users unless it's like a super specific use case, maybe with, um, maybe you have a modal or a login where people are not allowed to go further, I don't know, but usually you want to make sure wherever people can get with their keyboard, they should also be able to get away. Um, then you want to make sure, I mentioned this with the color contrast already, you want to make sure your focus is visible so that people know at all times where they are on your page. And um, the tab order should be logical. So in English and German, we would go from top to bottom and from left to right when reading. And we want to kind of simulate that with our tab order. And we're going to have a look at what that could look like um, on our project. So what I will do now, I'm in the middle. Why? We'll tab onto our page. Yeah, here you see I have it's a hideous color combination, but you see where I'm going. I'm using the tab key to go through my page. And we can see that we can reach all the interactive elements, right? And um, so this is something that we want to achieve. If I have a little bit more complex page and I don't want to manually tap through every single time, I could use something like a, um, a tool to help me visualize this. And this is going to give me the tab order and kind of neatly show where people are going and in what order. So this is kind of, kind of cool. Mm. And what you see here, I'm going to clear that. What you just saw here is the first thing is my skip link. 
So if I come to the page, the first thing that I tap to is my skip link. If I press enter now, I'm going to jump directly to the body. This is something that is going to help folks who are navigating with the keyboard to not have to go through a super complex um, navigation and logo and your brand details every single time if they just want to, they know where they're going, they want to have a good time, they don't want to spend all the time on the navigation. So this is something that comes in super handy for that. Um, and so what, what we did there is basically in my header, I have a link that's linking to, to my main content. I've hidden it until it comes into focus and then it's seen, right? So this is something that's quite neat for folks who are relying on keyboard um, navigation. A skip link is something that you can do. Um, it's also super important to keep, stick to the, I really hope there's no sound. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, you can al it's also important to stick to the hier hierarchy of the headlines because as you can see, um, this is with Mac and VoiceOver, but people using a screen reader, regardless of their system, um, they can use a tool to navigate the page a little bit differently and they will, I'm just going to start it again, they will have the option to, uh, for example, go through the landmarks, through the headlines and or through the links and kind of browse a little bit more efficiently than we do. Um, so this is why that's super important, right? It's also a really cool um, thing to try out maybe on your own, on the projects that you're working on. It's quite useful. And um, all right, don't do that again. Let me continue, please. There we go. <laughs> and um, and that's, so your semantic HTML then is kind of where it all ties in together, right? So um, I said in the beginning, if you're writing good code, it's usually already a lot more uh, accessible um, than if we kind of mm, play around with a bunch of divs and style them <laughs> the way we want to. And that means, for example, also providing um, alternative text to make sure that our content is perceivable, not only uh, through vision, that we don't have things like empty links, for example, super annoying if you're using your keyboard and you end up on things that are actually broken. Um, and kind of using the elements for the purpose that they were giving and investigating a little bit maybe what am I really trying to say here? How can I convey as much context uh, to a screen reader as I wanted to? Um, things like, for example, picking the right input type is going to be so helpful if you're trying to fill out your phone number or whatever on your phone and just opening up the little number pad. We all know that that makes us very happy users, right? Um, and the headline hierarchies we've just seen is going to be very beneficial for our keyboard users. And <laughs> I don't know if you know uh, HTML Hell from Mano Matuzovic. Yeah. Uh, if not, check it out. You can have a good laugh over there. Um, yeah, it's going to speak for itself, just don't do things like this. Um, he also has another page that's kind of cool. It's the button cheat sheet where you can um, have a look at the different ways in which people use buttons versus links because there's usually a right and a wrong. And um, I couldn't say it any better, so I highly encourage you to check, <laughs> check out this um, resource because it's really it's making a big difference to folks and um, yeah, it's <laughs> uh, really helpful. And um, if you were interested in checking some of your content, of course you can go ahead and inspect manually and see, okay, so where's my H1, where's, uh, do I really just have one? <laughs> um, what's about, what, what about my navigation? How am I using different elements? Um, but there's also tools like, for example, let me open up the dev tools, maybe make it a little bit bigger, there we go. Mm, there's multiple tools like this. Um, I'm a fan of the X dev tools and I can scan my page and this is, <laughs> this is um, a bit misleading because it's of course a super small project. Um, but you will be guided through all the different issues on your page, right? And it's going to tell you, okay, so here the thing that's missing right now is a title element in the navigation. I can then open it up. It's going to tell me what's wrong. 
I missed adding a language in my HTML tag, which is going to be uh, a problem if, because the screen reader doesn't know what to pronounce things in. And we've all like used uh, Google Maps in, in a different country, and it just couldn't pronounce the street names, and it was really funny until it wasn't anymore, right? So. Um, this is something that uh, we want to make sure we do, and then I can find out more information to kind of guide me through um, all the things that might have gone wrong with, um, with my code. And here, it's just one issue, but usually if you run it on a, like if I ran it on our company's page and it had like 94 issues or something, and that's, that's I would say that's the average if you do like an accessibility audit. So there's some uh, good things to, to kind of go through here. Um, yeah. And um, if you're new to accessibility, that might have been a lot of input from different angles and a lot of topics to dive into deeper. But of course, there's always a lot more, right? So for example, um, if you're considering testing for accessibility and maybe you have already good color contrast, you've got your keyboard accessibility all that set up, then maybe it's a good idea to start um, testing with different screen readers, right? And there's lots of different options. We got VoiceOver for Mac, um, Narada, Narada, JAWS, and NVIDIA are for Windows, and then uh, Orca is for Linux. And um, those are just the ones, as far as I know, for desktop versions. So there's different options to test them on mobile. And all of this is worth checking out, because of course you want uh, accessibility doesn't stop at the desktop version of your of your website or your project, right? Um, you can consider using accessible fonts. That's also a super big topic. Um, and investigate a little bit more. There are fonts that are specific to uh, neurodivergent folks, again, like um, that help people, for example, with reading disabilities read. And there's lots of um, things to geek out on. <laughs> I think it's really interesting what helps our brains distinguish between different letters, for example. Um, you can look into audio and video transcripts uh, or even add sign language versions of your content, <coughs> depending, of course, again, who your audience is and what their requirements might be. And also thinking about language accessibility, so not only enabling translation, but offering an option for simple language, for example, um, is also a big factor. Um, if you're convinced now, and maybe you, um, yeah, you're at the start of a new project, of course it's always going to save you a lot of time and effort if you can start, begin implementing accessibility right from the start. Um, usually that's not the case, usually accessibility is kind of brought in later in the life of a project. Um, I was working for a very big uh, German car company and uh, they Oh, we have uh, we have a couple of months to implement web accessibility double A standard, basically overnight, and I don't know 18 markets or whatever, and it was um, hell. <laughs> so, so it's always better if you start earlier. Um, if you're not in the position to do it early, what you would usually do is do kind of an assessment, an accessibility audit, and. Maybe you would use an automated tool like the XDEF tools, for example, to check, um, okay, so where am I at? What, uh, what is going on on my page? Um, are there things that I can kind of quickly already fix on the go? Or how would I go about it? How, what is the scope, right? Um, for that, it's usually a good idea to kind of figure out what requirements do I want to meet? Do I want to go with, or do I have to comply to certain laws because maybe my page is live in Canada? Or um, do I just want to make a better user experience that really depends on um, what you want to do and also kind of on your resources that you can allocate to that project, right? Um, currently, we're in the process of uh, making the page for our employer um, more accessible. And uh, what we did there, because we have no resources, <laughs> Um, is to check, okay, so what's the most common user journey? We went into Google Analytics and checked, okay, so what five pages are the most commonly used? What um, kind of, yeah, what tools are people using on our page? What's most popular? And then we can start there. If we have to limit ourselves, might as well do it where it makes the most sense, right? Um, and this is something, if you have limited resources, that might be, might be a good idea. Um, and maybe there are things that you can 
do relatively quickly and just kind of implement in the natural flow of things or you have something where you can say every time we touch something, some component, uh, some something, <laughs> depending on your project, um, then we're going to already run accessibility tests. Um, and then, of course, if you've done your initial audit, you want to make sure you continue to improve accessibility and continue to stay on top of things. And automation can really help you there. So you can maybe um, include accessibility inventors in your development environment. Maybe um, you can use pipelines and run automated tests every time you push something to your repo. You want to make sure to educate everybody on the team to first of all, know of the importance and who that benefits and why we're doing this. Because, of course, it's always a little bit extra work. So you want to make sure people know what they're doing it for. And also kind of remove barriers. So, for example, if you work with a content team and you make alternative adding an alternative text a requirement, then it cannot be forgotten. And then you already have that. You can kind of get rid of the human factor <laughs> who is maybe not having a good day sometimes. It's, um, yeah, so you don't forget that. And, and of course, if you can, it's always better to hire a specialist, right? There are folks who are literally native in accessible, uh, accessible technologies, so they work with these platforms, they use screen readers, and they will be so much more um, proficient in testing with them than people who will learn that later in life because they want to test for accessibility. So um, that's always a good idea. Um, and yeah, now would kind of be the time for questions, if you have any. Thanks for listening, first of all. Um, and Jess, if you are interested in any of the tools, you can either scan the QR code or the link is up there, and there should be, I hope it works, <laughs> there should be the, all the tools that I just showed. Um, and if you have any questions, Later, you can also always text me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. So, I have a question about the fonts that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, I was under the impression that um, people who may require special fonts, for example, because they're dyslexic or something, would configure them in their system instead of relying on the fonts that the website has specified. Now I was just wondering, sh if I'm writing a CSS, should I just assume that someone can override it, or should I say, okay, I will make a drop down so people can select, or what mm. would be your recommendation on that? Mm. Um, your, I would assume also that there are uh, tools in place to help people if they have very specific requirements to replace that, for sure. Um, I think the accessible fonts would be something that applies mainly to things that are where people can't overwrite it, maybe. Um, so I, I would assume a drop down with different fonts wouldn't necessarily be necessary as long as you make sure that, um, yeah, it's overwritable, right? Because uh, sometimes there's not an option. But yeah, good point. Hi. Um, yeah, you showed a lot of uh, automated tools to evaluate uh, websites, for example. Um, but of course, I guess then it won't find all the issues, right? Like, yeah. um, so you could also do user studies with actual paired users. But how, how far do you get with these automated tools already? Because it seems much more like yeah, I can just use it on my own for free yeah. um, without uh, going through a complicated process. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I always find it hard to say because sometimes people run, for example, the lighthouse test and then they're like, yay, we got a hundred score, we, we did perfectly, right? And usually that's not exactly the case. So first of all, I would always, if you're using free tools, I would always try to run different versions because they might have slight differences. And that's only, um, for me, that would only be the foundation of further investigation. I would never solely rely on those for sure. And then if you have the capacity and the money to pay for like user group studies, I mean amazing. That would that would be that would be great. Um, so I would it would automated testing would always only be an addition 
to um, the, the manual testing that you also have to do for sure. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you recommend one of the existing frameworks where you have experience and can say, you know, if you do it with something like Twitter Bootstrap or Tailwind, then that it provides a good out of the box result? Mm -hmm. You mean for styling or just in general? In general for Marco? Mm -hmm. Because um, I'm a massive fan of Swelt. And they actually have accessibility warnings in their compiler, and they will give you like a lot of warnings if you don't. Can actually, can we have time? Yes. And where's my code? There we go. So if I were to, can you see okay? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. If I, for example, please don't judge me on the code. It's <laughs> there's lots of issues with this. Um, but if I, for example, delete my href, it's going to give me, um, and this is the compiler, right? It's going to say like, hey, this should actually have um, an href, or if I go ahead and delete my, where's my image? Here we go. If I delete the alternative text, it's going to complain as well. So I think that's super cool, and more and more frameworks are actually doing stuff like that. Um, and it's quite extensive. Like, you can get quite... It's, it creates awareness and it has like a really good baseline. And for um, Tailwind, for example, at first I thought it's a bit of a hindrance because it deletes all inherent styling, which I find kind of useful because it has like the focus outline for interactive elements or the underline for the link, for example, which I want. Um, but it makes it more coherent to test across all browsers and all different platforms, right? So. I'm undecided, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point to look out for uh, when checking for new tech to use, for sure. I think I know you. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe just to strengthen your argument even more, and really in the talk, you brought up some points, uh, some arguments in favor of these things. And then you were worried about people who were worried about um, you know, money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think SEO ranking. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, at sites that do a really good job with accessibility generally rank higher. Absolutely, yeah. Because the, the screen readers and the Google crawlers don't work so differently, right? That's a really good point, yeah. Um, and, yeah. I, I feel like it shouldn't need that, but it does, usually, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you had any specific expectations for those upcoming laws. Specifically, I would be interested in if you would expect, you know, if, if, if a new startup like releases a product, whether they would be required to be double A compliant from mm -hmm. day one, or whether you think, whether you expect this is rather for larger companies or other thresholds that need to be passed first. Yeah, um, so as far as I understood, um, the laws that are coming are not going to affect small companies and especially it's going to be more towards um, institutions that provide some form of a public service, if that makes sense. So uh, similar to what's currently already um, in place in the US or in Canada, where of course universities, um, medical institutions, all of those things have to have a certain standard. And I would, but take this with a grain of salt that I, I tried to read these legal <coughs> documents and I would say I failed. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, it's difficult to understand and I think it's going to take some time until every country uh, in the EU kind of makes their decision on how strictly they want to interpret it. But from what I read from an accessibility standpoint, it was a bit dis disappointing um, because it's not super strict, to be honest. But it's just something to look out for, um, depending on your industry, your company, etc. Yeah.